Good evening. Welcome to another edition of the Shadow Trader Video Weekly for Sunday, October 3rd, 2021. I am your host, Peter Reznicek from ShadowTrader.net. Wild, wild west. It certainly feels like it. Anybody who was trading really this whole past week, but especially Friday, should know why I chose that name for this video. Homage to this guy right here, of course, Cool Modi. 1988 uh, was the year that came out. Fantastic song. But really just a very volatile, volatile market all over the place. Uh, the original title of this video, I'll tell you, before the big turnaround on Friday was going to be the beatings will continue until morale improves. And obviously that's kind of a, you know, it's a joke. It's, a, it's something people say, and it's a joke because it's like a chicken and egg, like conundrum. And I was thinking that the market was really caught in that same type of dynamic of like, for instance, how is the market going to rally without tech stocks rallying again? And how can tech stocks rally if interest rates don't come down? And how can interest rates come down if, you know, the outlook for inflation is up and commodity prices are so high, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you see how everything gets connected. And until something breaks in that chain, you know, the situation doesn't improve. But obviously, the situation did improve in a big way uh, on Friday. So we're going to get into a lot of technical stuff uh, in this particular video. Uh, going to talk about monthlies for sure, because we finished up monthly charts on Thursday it was the end of the month. Uh, Friday was the first trading day of a new month. So we'll look at how those monthlies look. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, sectors, obviously. We'll do the normal TA uh, on the dailies as well. We'll look at a little bit of Fangman Plus T, all the stuff basically that I like to look at. A uh, little bit of market profile um, as well. Uh, and also I'm going to touch a little bit upon a trade of the week, but a little bit different this week because um, I usually show you uh, how things are going and pull out a winning trade to talk about. This is actually a losing trade. We're not closed with it yet, but it is a trade that uh, is heavily underwater. This one is particularly troublesome, so I'm going to kind of break it down and go through uh, the different parts of the trade of when we entered, why we entered, what's going on with the trade, why it's kind of getting out of control uh, right now, or, or the exact point where it kind of went off the rails, what mistakes I made along the way, and uh, you know, hopefully everybody will uh, learn something uh, from the process, right? Without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, I'm going to begin the technicals with a very high level view, meaning the monthly charts, because we obviously just wrapped up a month uh, earlier in the week uh, on Thursday. So first things first, there is the concept of one time framing, which is where a low is higher than a previous low and then continues to make higher lows. And the um, and here you you gr you cross it by a little bit, but that's okay. It's still one time framing. And basically, we had 11 months of one time framing that got broken. It, it breaks when you move below the uh, prior period's low. We had 11 months of one time framing broken in the S&P. And more importantly, this down bar, which was September, is a 5% uh, correction from the high. Okay, and that's somewhat noteworthy. I mean, it's a it's of decent size. And we'll just kind of carry that forward that we came off uh, 5%. Now, if we move into a daily, here's where things get really interesting. First thing you should notice is pretty, I wouldn't say classic H pattern because obviously you have an H pattern. And I think that that's what's causing some of the uh, difficulty in the market to go lower. Generally in H pattern, this part would be a little bit like here, it would not be so gradual. But given that you had this big acceleration here to the downside that kind of created the post of the H. Um, I, th I think it, it, it bears noting that it is that type of pattern. And generally, as I always say, H stands for hell is for shorts or hard pattern to get lower out of. And it just, you know, oftentimes this particular break here doesn't work for shorts. And when I say this break, I mean that once the letter H is completed, then everybody thinks that the short has to be right here. Obviously, you know, if you tip, once you take out the low, you should go lower to the next uh, support level, and a lot of times you don't. And what happened today, uh, this being Friday, is you had obviously a huge reversal, kind of a fake out move down below, and then rallied back up. Now, have we broken trend? That's a very, very important thing to note. I say no, we have not broken trend, so you want to keep that in mind. Not difficult to do, just connect your tops right here, and that's your downtrend. And you can, that might be a little bit messy. You can do it a bunch of different ways. You can start from this bar. It doesn't really matter. Just swing it out and wherever it touches, that's where you wanna be, and that's your trend. So obviously the trend line is not broken. Now, the other thing I want you guys to pay attention to 
is the fact that we came to the back side of the channel. This is the channel that we have in play here in the S&P and a lot of the, or I should say most of the action, you know, for quite a while has been inside of this channel. And now we broke out and we rallied to the back side of the channel. So your first order of business on Monday is going to be to see whether or not this is resistant. Technically it should be when you fall out of a channel, that underside of the channel then should be, um, you know, should be resistant. All right. Now, when you look at this chart, this is something that I talked about with my options advisory subscribers earlier in the week. We had a lot of private sessions this week. And one of the things that I talked about was how is the current market different in terms of like, is it going to rally back like it, like it always does, or is it different this time? Right. And there is something very specific that is different this time. And it's actually very simple. And it's the fact that look at the price action and look at where it is in relation to the 50 period moving average, which is the red line. Every time you come into the 50, you support, support, here you break only one day, go back, support, right? Everything's just been riding the 50. This is the first time in a while since basically back here, and it was only a couple of days, where you have a lot of price action underneath the 50, correct? So this is, this is actually noteworthy. So we will see, that's another thing that we need to pay attention to, in the coming days, weeks, and see if the market rallies back and retakes the 50. Also notice that there is what some people call a death cross. I don't really use that term all that much. It you know, can mean a number of different things, but when you have a faster moving average, uh, usually I think the actual death cross is like 50 through the 200. This is the 200, but let's just call it a death cross for, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes. Whenever you have a fast moving average, that is coming down through a slower one, that's that cross and it is bearish. And notice that we haven't had that for a while. Again, going back to all the price action in the S&P, the moving averages are stacked up the way they should be. A healthy market has moving averages stacked where it has faster, a little bit slower, slowest. I always use the same ones, 20, 50, 200. And notice the stacking. The stacking is always there. They're always stacked properly. And that's kind of the sign of a market that's basically in trend and is uh, moving uh, in one uh, direction. Okay, now onto these lines on the chart. Pay attention to this stuff going forward because if the price action from here is lower, these are the levels that you're going to want to see. They're, they're pullbacks here on the S&P. And as I showed you earlier, when we looked at the monthly chart, it's actually interesting that a lot of them actually line up with monthly lows. So that's kind of noteworthy. So you may want to write these down is that if we see bearishness this coming week, 42.33 is where the market would go beyond that 41.64 and then to 40.56. And remember, keep in mind that as I was saying, this is about 5% right to here to this low is 5%. So you can take that and just kind of double it. And if it was going to be a 10% correction, you would probably come down closer to the, uh, you know, 41 something area uh, up in there. All right. So keep that uh, also in mind. All right. Let's take a quick look at the NDX. Tech stocks look a little bit different, obviously, because you've got this very long term trend line. You are getting the cross almost, not yet. It's a little bit strong because you haven't gotten the cross yet. Um, just the general uh, volatility in the NDX makes it so that notice that even though the general trend is higher, you don't have the stacking of the moving averages so cleanly as you do uh, in the S&P. It's a little bit wilder. So you've got the stacking here, but not here. You cross through here, you cross through here, you're kind of intertwined. So just it's just noteworthy. It just basically tells you that it's a little bit uh, more volatile. But really what I want to focus on in the NDX is the fact that if you go out to the weekly, Look at this trend line, how perfect it is. This is from the April lows right here. We'll call that like the, the COVID low, right? And perfect touch. And look at the bounce here, like two weeks ago, right where it should. And then this week we get a break, which is the first time in a very long time that we've gotten a break. So do we go lower? Hard to say, but Obviously, once the trend line is broken, the path of least resistance is to the downside. So these are the levels you want to write down. I have this low here, 1445.07. I'll just put that on the daily so you can see it clear. It's actually this pullback. And then the 1407348, I mark that at that level because that's the exact uh, point of this particular high right here, which is the high of this consolidation area. And it's very common that markets will break out 
and then go to the, uh, you know, go back to that consolidation area. So keep that in mind. Um, notice that this area is also important because you have a cluster of prices here that kind of hung out and then finally broke higher. And again, now you've broken trend here and there's potential to go to here, right? That would be your obvious uh, next target um, in the S&P. Same, or in the NASDAQ, excuse me. And same thing as we did in the S&P, draw your trend line now to the downside. Start here, and I call it the swing out method because you just start and you swing, swing, swing until you hit something, boom, like that. And notice that it actually works out perfectly because it touches this high as well. Almost every time, the swing out method is the way to do it. That is the true trend line. I've gotten a lot of questions over the years. People have asked, well, do you use the shadows or do you just use the bodies? Do you use logarithmic scale charts, all this stuff? Always the shadows, meaning catch all the price action. That means that a trend line would start, uh, for instance, from, you know, if this is, it would start from here. You don't want to start it here from the body. Uh, and I always just use uh, regular, uh, I think it's called arithmetic scale charts, uh, not logarithmic scale charts, just regular because um, it, it just works. Same thing with the moving averages. Uh, I never use exponential. I always just use simple. I'm just used to that. And I find that they work, uh, especially in very specific uh, intraday periods, such as uh, futures on RTH only charts. That's something that I talk about uh, in the weekly options advisory all the time. I always send out snapshots of 15 minute 20 MAs. It's kind of a special chart that I use because it's 15 minutes, 9.30 to 4 p.m. only on futures. If you have a charting package that can approximate that, or maybe if you just wanna use SPY, there's a uh, free tip for you. It's very, very interesting for day trading. The 15 minute, uh, 20 period moving average, but again, on a chart that is only from 9.30 to 4 p.m. All right, so that's the technical picture in the NDX. Again, no major change until we get um, a change in trend. And in the same vein that the S&P was underneath the channel, the, the NASDAQ is underneath a very long trend line. This is, this is actually a very, very big trend and it's now underneath. So the path of, path of least resistance is down still even with the reversal on Friday. Okay, let's talk about rates for a moment. A big part of why we got a turnaround on Friday obviously has to do with uh, rates kind of change, changing gears here and falling down uh, pretty hard. The next key level that we want to pay attention to is obviously going to be 1.4 because it is that breakout level. Now, that being said, we did break trend, which would be bullish for rates, which is bearish for tech stocks. And you can see here all the price action above. But then on Friday, we fell back into range. So what I want you to pay attention to next week is if rates continue to come down, NASDAQ probably rallies a bit, takes S&P with it. But watch this 1.4 level to see if support happens there. You can see that before, every time rates came up to this level at 1.4, they backed off. And that's what I think was keeping the market a bit higher. And then we had this breakout here moving up above the 1.4, went almost to 1.6 and now kind of coming into range. So this is very, very key. I want you know pay very, very close attention to this in the coming uh, days and weeks because it's somewhat of a clue as to how the uh, NASDAQ will act. All right, let's briefly take a look at volatility. There was a big spike in the VIX here. Uh, this was on September 20th, and that's actually a swing low in the market that was um, tested uh, on Thursday uh, of this week. We actually tested that, but volatility did not go higher as we did that. Volatility stayed in this range. What I am paying attention to as far as vol is concerned is the fact that I think this kind of feels like a rounded bottom to me. And I know that volatility can just it's very barcode-ish, meaning that, you know, you have like a trend here and then it breaks and it kind of falls and it spends a whole lot of time down here. And then, you know, volatility is a mean reverting thing. And, and that's obvious. I mean, everybody knows that. But there are periods where volatility kind of stays elevated. So what you want to pay attention to on this particular chart when you're watching vol is just basically watch the trend line, because even though it is a very, you know, barcode type crazy uh, movement, the trend lines do matter. So here you have this sort of uh, floor at 14 and notice where you come into a higher low, higher low, slightly higher low, higher lows, trend is higher, equal low. And now we've come into here. So watch vol around the 20 to 19 handle. 
as we come into trade next week. If we fall down below it, that's kind of a bullish sign. If you see volatility back in the teens, it tells you that fear is basically moving out of the market. If it stays a little bit elevated, market probably stays a bit more jittery. And those of you that are into the shorter time frame type of trading, be it day trading or short-term options trading, which is a lot of what I do, like weekly options, this will also be a signal for you because shorter-term traders want this volatility to stay elevated. And you'll notice that if it comes down below that 20 handle and starts to hang out more in the high teens, then the day time frame trade and the short term options trade will be a little bit more difficult. The options won't be as juicy on day trades. You, the moves won't be as big. All this is kind of tied into uh, to volatility uh, in general. All right, let's take a brief look at sectors in the S&P. There is so much push pull in this market when you look at these daily charts, and I think that's why uh, the market is basically acting like it is and why it acted how it did on Friday in terms of just acting so wild and having a, a false break um, and then, you know, turning right back around kind of with a vengeance, a lot of short covering. I think uh, it's, it's a number of factors. I think part of it has to do with the interest rates coming down. Uh, some of it may be due to peak COVID. Um, there was news also um, on Friday about Merck coming out with a COVID pill. Could be, you know, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't like to ascribe that sort of thing to, to bullish sentiment, but it could be um, a part of it. But a lot of it really has to do with the push pull in the sectors in that when you look at the 11 sectors that make up the S&P, many of them are just not that weak. Obviously, you can look at technology here, which is a huge driver. It's a big percentage weight in the S&P. Uh, looks very much like the NASDAQ 100 chart. Um, that's going to kind of move with the market. But you've got other sectors like energy and financials for instance, that are wholly dependent on other factors and they look a lot more bullish than bearish. So look at XLE, obviously with the uh, price of crude remaining uh, strong, about 75 a barrel, uh, XLE is strong. Uh, XLF, which is financials, uh, are looking pretty good. The uh, advent of higher rates obviously plays uh, well for that sector. And then let's look at some others. Let's look at uh, XLI, industrials, kind of just like bending to the downside, but no real major break. Same fake out as the uh, S&P. Communications, uh, notably higher on Friday and no real uh, definitive break as well. Uh, consumer discretionary, just kind of actually a higher low, to be honest with you. I shouldn't say just kind of anything. I mean, look, here's the 920 low. And yet, did the communication sector, which makes up about 10 to 12 percent of the S&P, did it make the same low? It did not. When the S&P actually breached this low, uh, it did not. And uh, XLP, which is consumer staples, those are weak. Those are definitely uh, uh, weaker. So that sector is a little bit of push-pull there with discretionary uh, and some of the others that look uh, a little bit stronger. And then you have these sectors that don't make up that much of the S&P, like XLB, materials, uh, XLRE, notice a little bit weak, probably on the heels of interest rates, and XLU also weak, also on the heels of interest rates, because you know a lot of these utility stocks, they kind of trade like bonds, because they kind of are basically bonds, right? They borrow tons of money, and they all pay a dividend, so... It kind of, you know, you can treat those stocks as if they were uh, bonds. So uh, they are moving down, which makes uh, complete sense uh, at a support level here, but uh, won't be a while until they hit uh, the next support, probably uh, lower for utilities. But again, in the whole scheme of things in terms of the S&P, they only make up about 2% of the S&P. And generally in a market that's healthy, that's moving up, you want to see some of these more defensive or interest rate sensitive sectors actually moving down right? Rather than moving up, you don't want to see this stuff rallying at the same time the market's rallying. So I'm not really too concerned about utilities. All right, let's take a very brief look at market profile. I just want to kind of focus on this low so you can see the distributions here. This is the overnight low from Thursday. And mark off this low on your chart on the futures. It's at 42.60. You'll want to remember that low because this was basically the low of this move in the futures market. Remember, we're not talking about the cash market now. We're talk, talking about futures, which is different from SPX and has other price action overnight, obviously, that the SPX doesn't have. Poor low here, carry it forward around the 42.77 and a quarter uh, area. So carry that low forward because it's, it's poor, meaning that the auction didn't really end properly here. Um, and we rallied from there. And in doing so, we left 
basically a very thin profile to the upside with single prints here. So we've got double or triple distribution, however you want to look at it, because there's a little bit of distribution here. This is this, this is this, you know, it's, it's multiple distributions separated by this area where it's very, very uh, thin here, this J period just kind of shot up. And notice how thin the volume is inside of that area. What does that tell you? All short covering. It's all short covering, basically. It's all people panicking, hitting the button, get me out now. Carry it forward in that these areas could easily be retraced early next week because these are not strong buyers. But, and this is a big but, also carry forward that a lot of rallies start this way. It's very disingenuous to just always think, you know, or to tell people rather that, oh, this is just short covering. This is single prints. This is a lot of emotional trade. That is true. That wouldn't be a lie if I said that. Say, look, this is just, there was extremely emotional trade on Friday. And that's the beauty of what the market profile shows us is that it gives us that extra window of time, that extra element and to look inside the distribution to see how much time was spent at each level and also how much volume was traded at each level. It is definitely telling us that it is a lot of short-term momentum traders, a lot of um, short covering. But again, at the same time, I've seen a lot of rallies that you know, are more sustainable start with days like today. Remember, the bigger traders usually trade in the middle of the move, not at the ends. So... All right, keep that in mind. I'll just, that's really all I wanted to say on the profile. All right, let's get into the trade of the week, which is Myrna. Uh, it's still a trade that is ongoing. It's ongoing until October 15th. So there's definitely uh, a lot of time left in it. Two whole weekly options uh, series are still to happen in the trade because we're long a call structure that goes out to October 15th. But I wanted to start with the chart and show you what exactly we did before I showed you, uh, before I show you the exact uh, trades in Marna. This was the day right here that the trade was entered, which was this day right here. And in this day right here, market was still pretty bullish at the time and the stock was showing enormous relative strength. And I thought that it was definitely telegraphing that it was gonna be higher. So just when we broke the trend line here, and you can see that we broke the trend line, we went long the 460, 490 call vertical, which was quite expensive uh, going out to October 15th. And the reason I went out to October 15th, I wanted to give the trade enough time to develop. My thesis was that we were gonna retest 500 over that time period. And thus being in the 460, 490, that was the vertical that I wanted to have. Obviously, things didn't go so well after that. You can see the stock just absolutely fell apart since then. Um, the whole, it kind of follows the IBB, which is the uh, biotech sector. All the biotechs kind of got killed and the stock just kind of fell apart from there. And let me just show you the trades, the trades uh, so you know where we're at right here. It's this one, number 747. So let's just break down some of this stuff of what has happened since then. You can see the entry was, uh, right here on the 23rd. That was the day that we broke trend and paid about 10 bucks for two of those call verticals. Again, going out to October 15th. Okay. Now, as is my MO, I never buy calls without selling puts, especially when I'm really bullish on something. And I think there's good propensity for it to go higher. Obviously I wouldn't be laying out debit if I didn't think so. So at the same time, I put on this structure, which is where I sold twice as many, four instead of two, 385, 380 put ratios, bringing in 60 cents uh, for each one. And since it was four, I was able to knock down the debit by over 10% right away, uh, right from the beginning. All right, and at the same time then, uh, a couple of days later, uh, once the stock started to pull off a little bit, also sold a call vertical, again, earlier in date than the 15th, and notice where it is, 464.75. I'm long the 464.90, and I sold a shorter term call vertical. Notice that it's also more narrow. This is $15, this is $30, and I did it twice as many of them uh, at the time. So I'm just working here to bring in credit, and you can see that these two trades knock the debit down by about 25%, and that's pretty good right out of the gate. 
it would have been good had the stock not fallen apart. As I just showed you uh, in the chart, the stock completely tanked and left this put ratio here completely exposed, the 385, 380 exposed. And I think the mistake that I made in this trade is the simple fact that I did not assume how strong the volatility could be to the downside when I was looking at, at the trade. Probably at the time that the 20 period moving average here was broken should have been the time to do something to the 385, 380 put ratio and tighten it up by buying the 375. I should have done that much, much earlier. Instead, we ended up doing that much later once the stock actually started to tank a bit more. And as you can see here in our spreadsheet, we actually ended up paying $8.11 for the 375 put. So just to be clear, if you don't understand what the ratio spread is, it's basically, it's looking like this, 385, 380, and it's like this. This is the spread, plus one, minus two. And obviously you've got a naked short put here because you have only got one here. So you need to buy this 375 in order to butterfly it off and, and basically close up this structure. And again, mistake on my part in that I didn't do this earlier. And this is really where the trade started to blow up is that we ended up paying $8 for that. All right. These trades here are basically just call credit. Once it was obvious that the stock wasn't, uh, you know, was, wasn't going higher, it made sense to start selling a whole bunch of call credit, bringing in all this money. Then close right here. I just closed off one of it. What happened next was a little bit of chasing my tail, right? Basically uh, in this part here where what I decided to do is knowing that I now have the butterfly structure on, I wanted to bring in some credit by selling off the bottom of it. And I was doing this on an intraday basis, seeing that the stock was basically showing some relative strength. And this is around the uh, September 30th. You can look at the intraday chart, basically, obviously just chasing my tail a little bit because I got rid of the put, bought back the put. That actually was a blessing in disguise that I actually bought back uh, the, you know, the bottom put. I didn't sell them all. I had four. I sold off two, as you can see, and then took them back. That was obviously um, the right move to make uh, at the end of business here because here is where the news came out that Merck was going to have the COVID pill. And that probably is what tanked Myrna lower, came down to trend here, caught itself. But obviously this would have been obliterated had we still been in any sort of uh, 385, 380 put ratio, right? Obviously being naked, that extra 380 put would have gotten destroyed. So we came into Friday's session with a straight butterfly that, that was fully underwater. And as you know, a butterfly that is fully underwater is worth zero. It can't really hurt you uh, anymore after that. Here's where things also get a little bit more interesting. And this also I think could be uh, a good kind of teachable moment to some people is, remember, if you have a butterfly that is deep in the money, meaning the whole thing is in the money, and you can use this trick yourself. Think of it as two verticals, right? These two trades are the two verticals. The butterfly was made up of 385, 380 and 380, 375. Well, if the whole butterfly is underwater and it's going to be worth zero at the end of the day anyway, why not sell the long? So you can see here, I sold out the long at 470. And obviously, in order for that to benefit you, you need the stock to rally. But what if it does? Like, what if the stock had only moved down a little on Friday? I sold the long part of the butterfly early in the day, got almost the max value of $5. Uh, and then, you know, like I'm saying, had the stock rallied, there was a chance that the 380, 380, 380 375 would have went to zero. It did not. Obviously, the stock did rally a little bit during the day, but it stayed mostly weak. It stayed underneath this entire structure, and I had to buy it back at max value. I do that at like a couple cents, you can see here, over the intrinsic value, because generally the market makers will not fill a in-the-money vertical at anything under its intrinsic value or even at intrinsic value. You generally have to pay a couple cents more, and it's a good idea to do it anyway just in case. You don't want to have any sort of... Uh, you know, assignment risk or whatever. So it's a good 
uh, it's good practice to buy them. But this is a very good thing for newer traders who uh, trade butterflies to think about that if you are ever in a situation where the whole thing goes underwater, don't just assume that it's going to be worth zero at the end of the week or end of the month or whenever it expires. If you can get very, very close to maximum value for the long part of the butterfly, meaning the long vertical, you should do it. And then and this is obviously on the put side, if you get a rally back in the other direction, there is a chance that the other one will go to zero and you'll be in much better shape because you will have collected all that credit from the long side and the other part uh, maybe goes uh, to zero. All right, beyond that, now that the stock is starting to find some support, now I started to sell some put credit. Uh, I'm selling here at 275, which is well under trend. It was pretty rich, it was good price. It was $1.90, those collapsed to about a buck by the end of the day. I will probably be more aggressive on the put side as time goes on. What are some of the things that I'm going to do, kind of looking ahead, to work on remedying this situation? A lot of people make the mistake that when they are in a debit situation, as I call it, and they buy a call structure, and then it completely falls apart to like one-tenth of what it was worth, they think that's it, the trade is over. They look at options as a binary event. I never do. I always say death before debit. I always do my best uh, for myself and my subscribers to try and sell around the position, do everything we can to get ourselves out of it. So what are some of the things that I'm going to be looking for next week in the Myrna chart to get active, to try to remedy this very ugly situation? Well, First thing I'm going to notice is that we kind of caught ourselves at trend here. We've got a low here at trend. Uh, stock went to about uh, whatever that was, about 325-ish in that area. Caught itself at trend and rallied a bit and left this gap above us. So first thing I'm going to note is I'm going to be watching the price action early next week and see if it appears that the stock wants to hold above trend. Just holding above trend is probably enough to get me to be selling more puts, maybe even slightly higher. Right now we're short uh, 275s. We might uh, sh sell some uh, around the 300 level and bring in a little bit uh, more credit as well. Next thing I'm gonna be looking for is the gap. Notice that we left about a 15 point gap above us. This is very, very interesting because this stock has a lot of volatility. And if we were to move to the top of the gap, Okay, then I have opportunity to do something on the call side for the gap fill. I may buy a vertical. I may even be as aggressive as buying a straight long call just by itself, a couple of units, and see if I can make that move of that 15-point move. That, the profit off of those calls obviously would do a lot to alleviate the loss on these 460 to uh, 490 uh, calls up there. The other thing I will be doing is I will very most importantly be allowing the chart to drive my decisions. Let's say that the stock is weak next week and the trend line starts to break, meaning that we move down below this low. Well, right now I'm short 275 puts. I'm probably not going to panic on those. I'll leave them alone because remember, I do everything in terms of size. So the original um, call structure was a, was a two unit trade and the shorts here are anywhere from four to eight to be aggressive. And so far, I only sold four. Eight units is the most that we go of anything uh, in this advisory. Everything works on that kind of level of two, four, six, or eight, or sometimes just one. So those are the multiples that are in place. So right now, knowing that I could be short as many as eight units and I'm only short four, I will probably, if we were to break trend, I would just lay off, wait, do nothing with these, and wait to see what the price action tells me. If the price action has some sort of a spike lower that then reverses, again, now you can sell some puts even lower. Get a, you know, do that. But again, let the chart dictate what you're going to be doing. Upside here, as I mentioned, would be some sort of a long call structure, but it's also a signal that that's where the calls that are above the trend line would start to get pumped up in value. I didn't want to sell any on Friday because they're not worth enough. But if the stock starts moving up here and moves towards filling the gap, well, all of a sudden, everybody's going to be looking at this trend line. You can bet that the call, calls rather that are 
400, 410, 420, 430. This is where people are going to start shifting their focus as to where they think the stock could go. And you're going to start to see those calls getting a lot of love. Because I'm in a debit situation and I need to remedy it, I would actually be selling those calls as the market moves higher. That is the smart thing to do. As the market moves up, you want to be selling those calls into it, uh, knowing that you have the uh, luxury or safety or however you want to put it, for lack of a better word, that the trend line is here. Remember, one of the things I always talk about is that the Black-Scholes formula does not know technical analysis. It just knows how fast the stock is moving, the volatility of it, the price of the underlying interest rate, time to expiry, et cetera. Plug all these things in and you get an option price, okay? It doesn't know that that line is there. So I trust that line. I think in this environment, even if we rallied near that line, it's probably not breaking anytime soon. That's where I would be selling calls for credit. So basically the whole thing in a nutshell is I will be as aggressive as possible, do everything I can to try to mitigate this situation. And in next week's video, you guys can check in once again. I'll, I'll, you know, this will have filled out a little bit with uh, more stuff and it'll give you an idea of where we are uh, in the trade and what has happened uh, since today. All right, last but not least, I just want to point out a couple of things here on the weekly options advisory, which I'm not going to go into detail. If you recall, I made this uh, statement, I don't know if it was in last week's video or before that, I used the term reverse engineer. Feel free to do it. This trade here and this trade here are fantastic trades to have in your arsenal. They're the type of trade that I teach my subscribers all the time that works out really well. Uh, basically starting with one structure and then selling inside of the structure to end up with a different structure so that basically you can start at a credit situation and then add credits onto it. As you can see in the Tesla trade, it was all credit, credit, credit all the way through. In the Amazon trade, the initial structure was put on for uh, even money, uh, just a tiny debit. It was basically the whole thing cost two cents. And then again, put another structure inside of it changing it. These two trades are essentially the same. The only difference is that this one is on the call side and this one is on the put side. So have at it. And that's all for this week. Thank you as always for spending a little bit of your weekend with me. So be careful out there. It is not 100% certain that the bias has switched to bullish because we have not broken trend yet. We may rally to that trend line. We may go halfway. We shall see. I like to take a very day-by-day -day, uh, type of approach and play things kind of safer rather than more aggressive uh, in these uh, types of periods, all right? Here's what I do every single day, and here's how you can uh, ride along with me if you like. Every morning, I come to the office and I write the pre-market perspective, which gives me a better feel for what the potential scenarios are in the ES and what key levels I need to look at. So I write up that report every morning, key levels, scenarios, pre-market indications, meaning telling you where the overnight inventory lies, net long, net short, is there shock and awe, is there potential for early trade or not. All of that I put into a very short report that you can probably read in like two minutes uh, or less, comes to your inbox at 9 a.m. sharp, Eastern time, 30 minutes before the market opens, so you have plenty of time to digest it. If you want to take a five-day free trial to that, just click that little link that you see right there up above my left shoulder, and uh, you can check it out for a week uh, for free. Beyond that, once the bell rings, I am all about weekly options advisory. That's basically my MO uh, all day long, and I am sending people trades uh, to their phone. This uh, Myrna that we just talked about uh, is one of them. If you'd like to join me for that, uh, you can also hit the other link right there that's uh, popping up over my left shoulder as well. $49 a month, never a contract, you can cancel any time. Best deal on the street, lots of good stuff included with that. Not only the trades, but my commentary all day, charts that I send out all day, you know, snapshots of different things with market internals and market profile that I'm seeing throughout the day, giving people all types of uh, heads up right at the moment, you know, that they need it. Um, private webinars, sometimes pre-market. This week we did pre-market like two times. It was fantastic. We had plenty of, um, you know, interaction uh, before the market uh, even opened, talk, telling subscribers basically what they should be looking for. Uh, live webinars during the course of the trading day. Uh, private webinar that happens uh, every Thursday, members only. So really a lot packed in uh, to one service for a very low price. So again, if you'd like to check that out, click that little link up there. All right. On behalf of myself and the entire Shadow Trader team here in beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as always, I am wishing you good trading and good night.